He is here. He's defeated death. He's defeated our enemy. And he is the most powerful thing we can ever even imagine. And I am so excited that we get to worship that today. Worship the resurrection and our salvation because of his sacrifice on the cross. And we're going to worship a lot today. We're going to sing loud and we're going to have a blast. And before we do that, I just want to start in prayer and, and, and go to God. So Jesus, we thank you so much for your resurrection and your power that only you can defeat death. Only you can defeat our enemy. And only you have saved our souls. So we thank you. Our words and our worship can't even come close to express our gratitude for what you've done for us on the cross. But we give you our worship and we exalt your name. It's your name we pray, amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met breathing but not alive all my failures they try to hide 
kings and you have always been the king of kings and you forever will be the king of kings. In the very beginning, before you even made the world, you were a king. Even when you made us and we rebelled against you, even in our rebellion, you were king of kings. Even when you came to your own people and they welcomed you as their king, you were king of kings. When a week later, less than a week later, when they had crucified you and killed you and rejected you, you were still the king of kings. Because three days later, you rose from the dead, you beat the hell out of death, and you threw hell into death. And Jesus, you gave that victory over death, hell, and the grave to us. So Jesus, we praise you as the King of Kings and we wait for the day when you will come again. When you will reign as King of Kings on this earth, Jesus, we praise you. Jesus, right now I lift up those in, our, in this room right now who are suffering, who are lost, who are confused, who don't know what to think or what to do. Jesus, I pray that you would guide them, that you would be with them. For those who are broken, I pray that you would be to them the great physician, the God of healing. We lift up all these prayer requests to you, God, and we lift up ourselves to you. We lift our worship to you this morning. I pray for the preaching of your word this morning as well through our brother Matt Strader. I pray that uh, he would speak your truth clearly empowered by your spirit. I pray for a special anointing on him this morning of your Holy Spirit. And Jesus, I pray that in everything that we do, we would not only be hearers of the word, but doers. That we would not allow the fact of your resurrection to just bounce off of us, but that we would be profoundly changed by the reality of what happened some 2,000 years ago. And I ask all these things in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward here, and we're going to continue our worship this morning through giving. And as we do that, a video will play kind of explaining some of the things going on here at Crossroads. Hey, everybody. Happy Easter. My name is Dan Allen, and I'm a pastor here at Crossroads, and we are so glad that we get to celebrate our risen Savior this morning together. I want to welcome you and share with you a few ways that you could get more connected with us. Every Sunday, we God's Word and time in fellowship across three services. We have a more traditional service at 8.30 in the chapel and a more contemporary service at 9.30 and 11 o'clock in the auditorium. We welcome you to join us next Sunday as we start our sermon series, which we have titled Practices. We will be looking deeply at what the Bible says about how we should pray and the importance of prayer in our daily lives. No matter where you are on your walk, this series will be a great insight on how you can grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. We'd also love for you to join us on Wednesday nights for our midweek programming. We have classes ranging from grade school all the way up to adults. We'll even cover dinner for you and your family as we provide pizza for everyone who comes. Doors open at 6 p.m. and classes start at 6.30. If you're interested in learning more about Crossroads and what we have to offer, please stop by the Welcome Center in the main lobby. You can also visit our website at crossroadswasion.org and click the I'm New tab at the top. Again, thank you for joining us this morning. He is risen. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Can we try that again? That's kind of the little thing we do, tradition. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Hey, grab your Bibles if you have them and open to Matthew 28. If you don't have one, that's okay. We'll have it on the screens for you. Uh, and actually our text for the morning is printed in your bulletin if you got one of those. Uh, basically, there's three different ways you can find it. If you can't have it, I can't help you if you can't find it. Anyways. Uh, I don't know what brought you here this morning. I don't know if you're, maybe you're a member or a regular attender here at Crossroads uh, to worship on Easter. Maybe you came with family and you're more skeptical and maybe not quite sure about Jesus, but you're just here for the tradition and the Easter turkey or ham. I don't know. Maybe you feel lost and you're kind of thinking, I really need to get back to church and I want to kind of find that relationship with God again. Maybe you grew up in church, but it's been a while. But whatever motivation that got you here this morning, I'm glad you're here. 
And here's what I want to do this morning. My, my heart and my desire is to motivate you, all of us, to, to hail Jesus as King. We've been in a series, All Hail the King. Last week we looked at him as the crucified king. This morning we want to talk about him as obviously the resurrected king. And my goal is this morning to convince and motivate all of us to follow Jesus and hail him as our king. Not just a king, but as our personal savior and king. And so I want to read our scripture for this morning. First, again, we're going to look at Matthew 28 and another text in Acts chapter 2. Normally we would stand, but we're going to do a lot of standing later. The second worship set is incredible, so we're going to sing a lot more this morning. But for a moment, let's, let's look at the scripture. Matthew 28, starting in verse 5, this is God's word. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he had said. Come and see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going on ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, now I have told you. In the second passage on the screen or in your bulletin, Acts 2, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Uh, This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, again, this morning, what I want to do for you is to motivate you, and I want to do that through three proofs that the resurrection actually happened, two realities of what that means for us, and then one application, one kind of response. Three proofs, two realities, one response, and if you haven't caught, that's three, two, one. Oh, yeah, the king. Anyways. Three proofs. First, number one, Jesus died. Proof number one is that Jesus died. And that may seem like an obvious one, but some people disagree about that. You can't have a resurrection unless you actually died. And some argue that Jesus didn't actually rise from the dead. Some say that he faked his death or that he passed out or that he had fallen unconscious and they mistakenly took him off the cross, which just play that logic out a bit. This is a man who was flogged 39 times with the cat of nine tails and was bleeding out and dying on a Roman crucifixion, and then throwing him in a cold, empty tomb somehow resuscitated him to full strength to move a stone. Doesn't make a lot of sense, logically, but no one who was there in the first century actually believed that. Every single person that was there at the crucifixion and three days later believed that Jesus actually died. The women that the angel speaks to in Matthew 28 came that morning to give burial spices to anoint his dead body. They expected Jesus to be dead. They came to anoint him with spices. So his disciples, the women, all of them thought he had died, believed he had died. In fact, in all of human history, we have no record anywhere of any one ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. It was the most efficient way to kill anyone. In fact, virtually every scholar in modern days on the planet believes that Jesus actually died. Here's a survey from the American Medical Journal, a medical association. This was a peer-reviewed study uh, by the Mayo Clinic where they said, clearly the weight of evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. So everyone in the ancient world believes Jesus was dead, and everyone who studies the scriptures or even studies history and understands modern medicine believes that Jesus was dead. It was a real resurrection because Jesus really did die. Secondly, another proof of the resurrection is the empty tomb. The reason we are here this morning worshiping and having this conversation at all is because the tomb was empty. Amen? The tomb was empty. And everyone concedes this point. In fact, there's zero argument. Jesus' body is nowhere to be found. The tomb was empty. Even the opponents of Jesus admitted such. In Matthew 28, if you look down later on in Matthew 28, here's what they say. In verse 13, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away. They're trying to cover up the scenario. While we are asleep, if this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. Read, they're going to pay him off. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So the leaders knew the tomb was empty. And so they conjured up this explanation that the, 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 the disciples stole his body and they paid off the soldiers and gave them hush money money to the governor. Don't you hate it when people in power cover up the truth? And that happened in the first century. 
with our own risen king. But the word was out. His resurrection happened and he began appearing to people. The empty tomb is something that must be dealt with. Everyone agrees that the tomb was empty. The question is just how did it get empty? And that's the final proof of evidence is the eyewitness testimony. Jesus appeared to many, many people. Now, for most of what we know about ancient history, in fact, all the stuff you learn about in your classes, kids, in your history classes, I don't know, how many kids do you like history? Anybody? History? Okay, a few of you. Adults, do you like history? Anybody? Okay, Netflix documentaries? Oh, yeah. Anyways, we all like that history stuff. But for most of the ancient history that we know right now that we would say, oh, yeah, I know about the pharaohs, I know about that from ancient Mesopotamia, it comes from one, maybe two sources. Very few things have more sources than that. So most of the stuff you learn in your classes, in your history books, come from one source, maybe two. But for the the belief that the disciples recognized or received or saw the risen Christ, we have no fewer than nine different sources inside the New Testament and outside the New Testament from historians like Josephus and Suetonius, who were, were definitely not Christians, but they were historians. And they recorded the fact that the disciples actually believed that they had seen the risen Christ. And it was kind of news in the first century. Oh, why is that important? Because some would say, oh, this resurrection myth was just na- late, came apart later in like the 300s and 400s when the Christians came into power in Rome. Eh, that's wrong. Because first century historians were reporting that, that Jesus' followers believed he had risen from the dead in the first century. In fact, we have an eyewitness creed that was, that was given in the first century within months of the resurrection, which Lee Strobel says is like historical gold in, in the ar- archaeological sense. So the Bible was written by eyewitnesses, and it was also written at the time of eyewitnesses. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. After that, Jesus appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, what Paul is saying is, if you don't believe I was an eyewitness of Jesus' resurrection, or Peter, or James, or John, or any of the other disciples, go ask the other 500 people that saw him, many of whom are living to this day. So the writers of the Bible are writing at the time when there are eyewitnesses walking around, living and breathing, could say, yes, I saw the risen Christ on that Easter morning or shortly after that in the 40 days. The point is, there is an avalanche of evidence that supports the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those are just three of many proofs. Now, if you came this morning doubting whether it actually could have happened realistically, have you actually looked at the evidence? What is the most logical explanation for what we have in the scripture and in history? I think if, you'll fi- if you read it, you'll find that the most logical and reasonable explanation is that Jesus actually rose. But that's great. You can have proofs all you want. But what I want to ask secondly is, why does that even matter? So what? So what that Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago? Why does that matter for you and for me? I want to talk about two realities that changed forever that resurrection morning, that Easter Sunday, the resurrection Sunday 2,000 years ago. Number one, the death of death. The death of death. If Jesus rose from the dead, then death is dead. What is wrong with our world today? Think about it. Primarily and most basically, our world is full of death. We are under the curse of death and sin. Scientists call this the second law of thermodynamics, right? That our world like, is moving from order to disorder, that it's moving from kind of order to decay, that we will all age and die. We ain't getting any younger. Can I get an amen for that? I know some of you. Amen just means it's true. Amen! <laughs> I heard somebody over there yell. Yes, we're all getting older and we're decaying and dying. Creation and disasters are happening. The world is broken and breaking. Why? Because of death. Death exists in our world today because of sin. Now, sin is just a a Bible term. It's actually from Latin, which means to miss the mark. It's an archery term where you would shoot an arrow at a target, and if you miss the target, that's called a sin. In the Bible, sin is missing the target of God's righteous target, his righteous standard. Now, before you think, oh, here you go, Christian, just being all righteous. Everyone has a righteousness standard. Everyone does. That's why you get so offended when people cross your lines. Every single one of us has a standard of righteousness of what we think is right and wrong. We all know something intuitively that there is right and wrong in the world, and that's because God created you and I in the image of himself, and that we know there is an ultimate moral right and wrong, and we have missed it. 
In the very beginning of humanity's existence, way back in Genesis chapter 2, God told our first parents, Adam and Eve, that basically, basically this is what he said. If you will trust me as your king, if you, will, if you will trust me and surrender to me as your king, then you will live and thrive and be my partners in filling this good world that I've created with my glory. God wanted humanity to be his partners. The world would be good and it would stay good as you fill the earth with my glory and rule and reign underneath my sovereign rule. But if you reject me, which in Genesis 2 and 3 was symbolized by eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you reject my definitions for good and evil and you make up your own, if you try to be your own king and queen and ruler, then you will surely die and the creation would die with you. You'll die because trying to do life without a creator is suicide. It's like trying to be a tree without sunlight. It's not possible. We were created to know God and be with God. So without God, it's pragmatically insane. Humanity would surely die. Friends, that's why some of you are here this morning and you feel like you're missing something in your life and you're thinking maybe church could give me the answer. And you're right. You are missing something. You were meant to know God. You were meant to have a relationship with God. That's why you exist. That's how he created you. And whenever you don't feel like something, whenever you feel like something's wrong with the world, it's actually true. You're right. Life without God feels like death. But it's not just death is a natural consequence of life without our creator. Death is also a moral consequence of our rebellion against our king, the king of the universe. We won't just die physically, but we will die spiritually in an eternal separation from God in a real place called hell. Because God is the ultimate righteous judge, he must punish wrongdoing, as any good judge would do. If you went to a court here in Fulton County or any judge anywhere, he would be an unjust judge if he didn't punish wrongdoing. When crimes are committed, punishment must be inflicted. Without that kind of justice, you cannot have peace in the world. And so God, the all-righteous judge, must punish sin. And God gave us the very breath in our lungs, and therefore we owe our breath back to him as a debt, our life to him. That's why Romans 6, 23 says it this way, for the wages or the price of our sin is death. Because we've chosen to define good and evil for ourselves, we live life without God, we are under the curse of sin and death, and we deserve it. But that is why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came. He didn't just come as a moral teacher or a leader or a revolutionary. Jesus came to die, to take our place. Jesus predicted this no less than seven times in his gospel messages. In Mark 10, 45, he says this. He's telling you why he came to the earth. For even the Son of Man, that was a title Jesus used for himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to give his life to pay for ours, to pay the moral cost for our sin. Jesus Christ died on the cross to cancel the life debt that we owed because of our sin. But he didn't stay dead. <laughs> Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over souls. Anyways, we sang that in first service at 7 o'clock this morning. I love that hymn. You should go listen to it and sing it later. But he didn't stay dead. He defeated death because Jesus wasn't sinful. He was merely paying for sin. He rose again from the dead. Death was actually the one that died that day. Jesus was the king who makes death run away. The grim reaper runs away from Jesus. Jesus is the conquering king. That's why Romans 6, 23 says it this way. The verse finishes, the wages of sin is death, yes, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Death is no more by faith in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, we have life beyond death. He sets us free from the curse of sin, the fear of death. The debt we owed is paid and done for on the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant it, which means his death is sufficient. The resurrection proves that you don't have to pay for your own sin, that you don't have to be afraid of death, that God loves you and wants to be with you forever. That's what we celebrate on Easter. And that leads to a second reality. Not only did death die, but eternal life starts now. Eternal life starts now. When Jesus was on the earth preaching the gospel, he proclaimed to the crowds, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right in front of you. You can grab it. You can taste it. 
Sometimes we can have this false understanding that Christianity is just about the future. Like, I just got my fire insurance and I'm just waiting until I get to heaven one day. And there is truth to the fact that Christianity is a lot about the future. We are waiting with anticipation for when Christ comes back. Yes and amen. But that's not all that Christianity is. Christ is ruling and reigning now. Christ is king right now, and we can live under his rule and reign and experience his joy and love and peace and mercy today by knowing him. This is why Jesus, when he was praying for you and I in John 17, said this, now this is eternal life, that they get to go to heaven when they die? No, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life to our Savior is knowing and, and being in a relationship with him every day. And you don't have to wait until heaven to have that. You can know Jesus today. You can li live with Jesus now. It starts now and it lasts forever. That's why Jesus said in John 6, 47 this way, Very truly, I tell you that the one who believes has eternal life. Has it right now. Present tense. Not we'll get it in the future, but has it right now. What does this mean? The reality of eternal life starting now, it means that you can receive life and joy and peace from Jesus like a branch sucking sap from a vine, he said in John 15. It means that you can go through any moment in your life and any time you need his grace, you can come into his throne room, Hebrews chapter 4. It means that you can face trials with, without being afraid but with joy because you can ask God for wisdom, James chapter 1. It means that you can tell God how frightful you are and your anxieties, you can pour them out to him any moment, Philippians 4. You have a new purpose for your life. You don't live in this world anymore. You're from another kingdom now. You're an ambassador of Christ, and you can tell other people how awesome Jesus is, 2 Corinthians 5. You get the privilege of now partnering with God, which is what Genesis was supposed to be. He redeems our purpose so that we can fill the earth with his glory and make disciples who, and teach them to follow Jesus, Matthew chapter 28. In short, everything matters. Everything matters because Jesus cares about everything we do and he is with us in everything we do. Isn't that the last words he said in Matthew 28, verse 20? And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Eternal life starts now, friends. Don't wait till your deathbed to get right with Jesus. Don't wait until you do a few more crazy things or sow your wild oats until you come to faith in Jesus. Come back to Jesus now. And if you already know this, praise Jesus and sing it loudly. And we're going to do that in just a moment. And go and tell someone else the good news today. When you see them out there, he is risen. And do you know why that matters? God doesn't just want to save people from the hell they're going to someday, but he wants to save people from the hell they're going through right now. Because life without Jesus is hell and death. Three proofs, two realities, and one response. And this response is for Christians and non-Christians, all hail the resurrected king. All hail the resurrected king. How do you do that? Romans 10, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Repent and believe. Everybody say, repent and believe. Repent and believe. Declaring Jesus is Lord, which means turning from your own kingship and saying, Jesus, you are my king. I repent of my own kingship and repent and trust in you. What got humanity in this mess in Genesis was that we tried to be our own masters, that we tried to live life and define good and evil for ourselves, and that is a fool's errand. Repent and surrender to Jesus as Lord and King. Repent and believe. Believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Believe that he died and lived for, you, lived for you and died for you and rose again for you. But Jesus has to be more than just a savior. He has to be your savior. There are no heritage Christians or proxy Christians. You don't become a Christian just because you're a, a, a Christian and you come to church on Easter. There's no such thing as a Christer, like a Christmas and Easter Christian. It doesn't exist, right? Yeah, that's a, Dan showed me that term. That was a great term. Thank you, Dan. Uh, there's no such thing as a creaster. You don't become a Christian because you grew up in a Christian home or because your grandma said a lot of prayers for you. That's great that she prayed for you, but you have to decide to make Jesus Lord of your life. You don't become a Christian by going to church any more than you become a car by getting into a garage or a disorganized tool chest by being in a garage. 
Just being there doesn't make you one. You must repent and believe for yourself. Jesus, I believe that you lived and died and rose again for me. I believe that you paid the price for my sins and I repent and follow you as my king. You can do that today, friend. Today could be the day of your salvation. What a day Easter could be for you in 2024. The day where you became robbed like we sang at the beginning from your grave and woken up to new life in Christ. And Christian, if you are here this morning and Jesus is your king, we repent and believe like this every day. We wake up every day taking up our cross and saying, Jesus, you are my Lord, you are my king, and I will follow you. Not my own selfishness, not my own flesh, not what the world tells me. You are my king. I repent from my selfishness and follow you. Every day I take up my cross. You are my king, and I believe in Jesus every day. Not to be resaved, but to live by faith. I believe, Jesus, that what your word says is true, that you and you alone are where my life is found. Every day you wake up repenting of your selfishness and following him. The way to become a part of this kingdom is repentance and faith. Repent and believe. Believe in Christ crucified and risen. And the way on into the kingdom is repent and believe. Repent of your selfishness and follow and believe what Jesus says. This is what we're called to. So three proofs, two realities, and one response. All hail the king. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we thank you and praise you for who you are. We thank you that you are the king of kings and lord of lords. There is no one like you. You are God incarnate who took on flesh and dwelt among us and you lived with us, understood what our humanity was like and you lived perfectly where we had failed and you died the death that we should have died. You died so that we would not have to pay for our own sins. You became sin for us so that in you we might become the righteousness of God. And you rose again three days later proving that your sacrifice was permanent You rose from the dead and gave us new life. And so now, Jesus, if there's anyone in this room that's hearing my voice, I pray that today, if they don't know you as king, that they would surrender today. They would turn from their own sin, their own flesh, and say, Jesus, I do believe that you died for me. I do believe that you rose again. Save me from my sins. I repent and I turn to you alone for life. Oh, God, I pray that today you would save souls that need saving. And God, for those of us that know you, that you would sanctify us, that you would make us more like Jesus, even now as we praise you and respond in worship to your resurrection. I pray that you'd be glorified in your people, that all of us would be transformed to look more like Jesus simply by praising your name. We respond now in worship to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond in worship. Stand and sing to our Savior. Oh, we sing. There was a moment when the lights went out, when death had claimed its victory. The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake and the veil was torn what sacrifice was made as the heavens Say hey.
great earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled away the stone. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards were so terrified of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified, but he is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen.
Who could it 
in the freedom that we have received in Christ, that through his death, when he said it is finished, all of our chains fell off, all of the debt we owed was paid in full. And then he rose three days later, assuring us eternity that we will rise with you one day. Victory in Jesus' name. We praise you and we thank you for the freedom and the grace that you've given to us by faith. We repent and believe. We trust in you. We surrender to you. We hail you as King of kings and Lord of lords. There is no one like you. We praise you for you are. God, Easter is a day of celebration, a party 
that we celebrate your goodness. We celebrate our freedom. We celebrate that Christ has risen from the dead. We rejoice and we give thanks. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you. Have an awesome Easter day. Celebrate with someone. Praise the Lord. He has risen. He is risen indeed. God bless. If you want to pray with someone, we'd be happy to pray with you on the sides in the back. God bless. You are dismissed.